Or a Welcome. Welcome to everybody. Oh, goodness. I don't think I automatically turned everybody's microphones off. So I'm going to be muting everybody. Oh, everybody can probably mute themselves. Most people know how to use Zoom by now. All right. Great. More people are coming in. So welcome. We're going to uh, keep letting people in. Great. It's wonderful to see everybody today. I'm so glad you could join us for a Friday afternoon field trip. All right. Great. So for people who are still coming in, um, please uh, mute yourself and we'll trust you to mute and unmute. Uh, we are mostly not going to be doing discussion because this is such a short um, program, but we will be using the chat. Uh, so why don't I go ahead and uh, get us started. Um, welcome everybody. Um, I am Ennis Carter, and I am the director of Social Impact Studios here in Philadelphia, but my role for today and my passion is as the curator and author of Posters for the People, Art of the WPA. Um, so we're here today to do a uh, virtual field trip to an exhibit at Carpenters Hall, and I wanna hand it over to Michael Norris, um, the executive director of the Carpenters Company. Hey, thanks, thanks, Ennis, and hello, everyone. Um, uh, as Ennis said, I'm Michael Norris. I'm the executive director of Carpenters Hall, and we're so thrilled to have all of you with us today. Uh, some quick history before we dive in. Uh, if you don't know, Carpenters Hall is a National Historic Landmark here in Philadelphia. It was built by the Carpenters Company in the early 1770s, and it's most famous for hosting the First Continental Congress in 1774, which, as I'm sure you recall from history class, was one of the most significant events um, in the founding of our nation. The Carpenters Company was founded in 1724 as a guild of master builders, and it actually still exists today as a professional association of architects, engineers, and builders. The primary mission of the company is to preserve and interpret Carpenters Hall but we also have a larger interest in architecture, the built environment, and in the design crafts. When Ennis told me last year that there were WPA posters featuring Carpenters Hall and other iconic Philadelphia landmarks, I knew we had to host an, an exhibition of them since they tied in so nicely to our interest in architectural history, art, and design. And we were thrilled that the Free Library of Philadelphia agreed to loan them. Of course, the pandemic got in the way of our plans, like so many others, uh, but we did have the exhibit open for a few weeks in November before we had to close our doors, and we hope to continue it again on site if we reopen in January. Uh, ironically, the current pandemic has created economic conditions that strongly mirror those in the 1930s that necessitated the WPA to begin with, so the exhibit actually has an added layer of relevancy now. And if you attended our panel discussion on Wednesday, you know that artists and activists around the country are already organizing around a people's WPA or a cultural new deal. So I'm sorry you can't visit us now to see Carpenters Hall and the exhibit live and in person, but you're gonna get the ne next best thing today. Uh, before I turn it back to Ennis, please welcome my colleague, Alex Palma. Alex is our assistant director, and he's actually live on site at Carpenters Hall right now. Alex? Hey, everybody. How are you guys doing? Thank you for joining us here today um, on Zoom. I know I wish we could see you all in person, but hopefully you all are home, staying safe, entertaining yourselves this holiday season. Um, so I'm outside right now, and behind me, you can see the front of Carpenters Hall. As you can see, it's a... Oh, it's a beautiful 18th century Georgian building constructed in 1774, or completed in 1774. And I'm going to take you inside to see the exhibit. So, I'm just going to close the door and lock it. And if anyone has a question about my mask, it is available 
um, in our online store, our newly minted online store, which you can access um, uh, from the homepage of Carpenters Hall's website, carpentershall.org. So I'm gonna flip the camera and show you, Oops. here you go. This is the interior of Carpenters Hall. This is the first floor of the building. Um, as you can see, uh, Carpenters Hall was constructed by the Carpenters Company. Um, the company itself was founded in 1724, about 50 years before the construction of the building. Um, and we know from historical records that the first Continental Congress would have met here on the left side of the building. There um, at the time of the first Continental Congress would have been a hallway through the center of the building, separating the space into two rooms. Um, and on the right side here, you can see our exhibit, Places for the People. So this um, was uh, installed in late October by uh, Yolan and Ennis. And I'm just gonna do a really, really quick walkthrough because we're gonna go in depth with these prints. I'm just gonna show you a quick, quick walkthrough. And I wish, um, I wish that times were different and that you all could join us here in person and see these in person, but a little bit of glare on that one. Here we go. All right. So that's, that's my bit guys. Oh, and hold up. This is a painting that was given to us back in the 1930s by an artist that was um, uh, uh, working under the WPA. So this was done by William John Coffey. It's a really, really interesting painting. And uh, yeah. All right, so without further ado, I will hand it off to Lara and Ennis to talk more in depth about um, the individual prints in the exhibit here. So take Great. it away, guys. Thanks so much, Alex. Uh, that was, it was, <laughs> I wish everybody could be there in person, but I appreciate you um, being our field dispatch and uh, taking us through not just how the exhibit might look if you were there in person, but also um, Carpenter's Hall. And hopefully you'll get to visit one day if you haven't already. So before we jump into actually looking at the posters, um, I wanted to just do, now that we have a good critical mass of 67 people on our Zoom, I'm so excited to see people. I wanted to just uh, do a little bit of Zoom housekeeping and um, let you know a couple of more technical details and then we'll jump right in. Laura and I will jump right in. So um, as I said, I am Ennis Carter. I am the director of Social Impact Studios in Philadelphia. Um, and one of our major projects is Posters for the People, Art of the WPA. And um, we, uh, we document and celebrate the posters that were made during the WPA era um, because there was no record kept of them. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but I wanted to let people know that if you are uh, on the full screen Zoom, um, we do these as a very informal Friday afternoon kind of get together. Um, we do not professionally host Zooms. <laughs> so we do the best we can. And I appreciate that everybody's also working with me while I'm working the controls in this case. Um, on Friday afternoon. Um, and just some tips. So if you want to only see the speaker who's speaking, if you go up to the top of your Zoom screen, um, there should be a window that you could toggle, a button that you could toggle between that says gallery view or speaker view. And if you don't wanna see the Brady Bunch uh, of these, of our 69 people now, um, then click on speaker view and you will only see the person who's speaking. Um, I do have everybody on mute, uh, and if you want to unmute yourselves, you can, but we're asking that people communicate through the chat um, and that uh, we, um, you know, don't hesitate to wait, don't wait for a Q&A, go ahead and um, drop those questions in there through the chat, and we will uh, keep, it, keep tabs on that. 
Um, if you want to, you could also put your name and where you're zooming in from in the chat so we can see who's here and how many people have come from far and wide to um, join us on this field trip. If you do want to um, even go one step farther and you'd like us to um, email you information about Posters with the People, the Free Library, Carpenters Hall, any of us here, um, then you can put your email in a private chat to me, um, which I'm on the list is at the top, and it's Carter. It says Social Impact Studios. I'm going to change that real quick um, to Ennis Carter. And if you private chat me your information, I will make sure that um, I get it to everybody. All righty. So um, I am just going to do a couple more things. Now we're going to, um, I'd like to introduce Laura Straffolino, um, who uh, will introduce herself because the titles and the different departments at the Free Library, they're, they are long. <laughs> And she and I are going to, I will, I will um, after Laura introduces herself, I will share my screen and we're going to look at each of the posters that are currently in the exhibit. So, Laura, welcome. Hi, Annis. Um, so I'm Laura Straffolino and I'm the curator of the Print and Picture Collection, which is one of the Free Library's special collections. It's located in Parkway Central Library. I am not located in Parkway Central Library right now because I'm in my house with most everyone except for Alex. Um, and I'm very excited to, to be here with Ennis and Michael and Alex um, and to dive into these posters. And a little bit later, I'm also going to tell you a little bit more about some New Deal holdings that we have at the Free Library of Philadelphia. Great. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to. Let me just get there. Great. So can everybody see my screen? All right. So before we start going through these posters, um, I just wanted to give everybody a little bit of a background on posters for the people. So actually, I'm going to pull up uh, this. If you were at the exhibit, um, you would see this uh, card on one of the panels um, that let me just move this. Uh, there we go. Um, and I thought I could read this to you so you understood uh, kind of where we were coming from. I imagine most people who showed up to this event have a general understanding of the history of the WPA. Um, but it's always good to have a refresher. So. In the 1930s, the United States was in crisis. The economic system had collapsed and one quarter of the country's workforce was unemployed. In an effort to rebuild the nation, President Franklin D. Roosevelt launched a series of programs in 1933 called the New Deal. The largest agency of this recovery program, the Works Progress Administration, employed millions of jobless workers in an ambitious campaign to build roads, bridges, and public buildings, and enhance community life through health, education, arts, and culture. So actually 3.3 .3 million people were hired um, through the WPA. The WPA poster division, which existed from 1936 to 1943, was charged with producing posters to raise awareness and promote a wide range of programs, activities, and behaviors that the Roosevelt administration believed would improve people's lives. From roughly 500 artists hired throughout the life of the project, more than 35,000 designs were created and 2 million posters were produced and distributed. So I just want to say that again. <laughs> so there, this, is the, this is the way information got out about the WPA programs that were helping people get back to work, but also rebuilding a really devastated nation. So 35,000 posters were designed by 500 people across the country, and 2 million posters were produced and distributed. Places for the People, WPA Travel Posters at Carpenters Hall, celebrates rare local posters created by the Philadelphia Division of the Federal Art Project to promote tourism in and around the city. This curated exhibit of original posters from the Free Library of Philadelphia's print and picture collection brings to light many that have not been on public display for more than 80 years. So I just wanna read the little blurb here um, about Posters to the People. Um, because there's no centralized government record of WPA posters. They were not considered art, even though they were hand silk screened uh, 
posters um, designed by very, very proficient artists. Um, they were considered uh, ephemera and part of the propaganda wing, and so they were not documented. Posters for the People is a people's initiative dedicated to building the most comprehensive record of posters created by the WPA artists. PA artists. They, we have brought together from public and private collections into a virtual archive that highlights the beauty and importance that WPA posters represent in our American social history. So I'll talk about that uh, at the end, but um, we basically go around and try to find all the posters that they that we can and document them in a public um, website that we that uh, we just decided needed to be made um, about uh, you know ten years ago we started this project. So all right, so I'm going to go back here um, and before we go through each poster, Laura, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the print and picture? Uh, division and and specifically the holdings that you have because this is a small sample of WPA posters. Sure, I'm actually going to talk about that after. Okay, great. Um, but yeah, we we have uh, about 116 posters. Um, that includes um, some series like like you know um, one color progressive proofs and things like that, and they're actually all scanned and on our website. Great. All right, and that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the Free Library's digital collection. Very easy to find if you go to the Free Library's, if you just Google it, <laughs> um, it's easy. You just go to the Free Library's website and um, you get into the digital collection. Yeah. Um, so this is the, um, the first poster that I pulled up because it is of Carpenter's Hall. Um, so, and we can zoom in on these, we'll, we'll do a little bit of that, but I just wanted to point out that this is one of the few uh, posters in this exhibit that we actually know is attributed to um, an artist. Most WPA posters are not attributed to artists because they were not allowed to sign their work. Um, they were not allowed to keep copies of their work, um, even though they were made in mass uh, quantities. Because they were considered government workers, and they were working, um, they were creating something for the government, not for art itself. But as we can see, these are amazingly beautiful, um, you know, posters that I'm getting into the middle of it here. That this poster was created by Catherine Milhouse. Um, and Catherine Milhouse was a children's book illustrator later. Um, she's most well known for The Egg Tree, which is a, um, children's book that uh, has Pennsylvania uh, uh, Dutch uh, iconography throughout it. She grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, and her parents uh, were Quakers, and they owned a print shop. Uh, so she um, had a lot of knowledge about printing, and she actually became the director of the WPA Poster Vision poster division in Philadelphia. So that does also tell you something about the WPA. It was very diverse. It had a lot of different um, flattened leadership structures. And a woman was made the director of it in, you know, 1935, 36 um, was when the poster division started. And the Philadelphia office um, most likely opened around like 37. So I just wanted to kind of uh, get into this poster because this is one of my favorites. Um, it is such an interesting, you know, uh, depiction of a, a, you know, revolutionary era building, historic property that is done in this like very contemporary way, even for now. I mean, it could have been something that I grew up looking at in the 70s, like the colors here and the shapes here. It's very uh, like friendly and whimsical in some ways. Um, and this would have been screen printed. So I just want to, this is just what's so awesome about this site is that you can really zoom in. So even though you can't be seeing these posters in person, this is a great um, uh, look at how you might see them at Carpenter's Hall. So this is a, I'm going to say it's a four color piece. Let's, let's, let's figure that out. Um, so we definitely have black in this piece. Um, we have black, uh, we have a light green, we have a yellow, and we have a reddish color. And what I think is going on here, let's see. Yep, I think those are all the colors. I think this is four colors, but we are working with a, a mesh screen 
Um, and at the uh, later in our presentation, I will play a video of me doing a demo of screen printing. But what they did was they made a lighter version of the red and maybe even a lighter version of the black, I think, to achieve this brown color here. This might be another color, not sure. Nope, it's not. You can see, so this is the red underneath and then this is um, the black on top. And in screen printing, uh, uh, when you do a progressive print, you always print light, the light color first, and then you put the next darkest, dark, and all the way up to black at the end. That's how this would have been done. All right. So I'm going to go out and go to our next poster, which this one is, I think, unattributed. Yep, so this is what is called a serograph, which is another term for screen printing. Um, and we uh, don't know who this was, but this would have been under the uh, direction of uh, Catherine Milhouse. And um, let's get in and look at it. And this one, I believe, um, this is, a, this is kind of a cool homework assignment for you. If you go to the library's digital collection, I believe this one, you can see the um, different prints. They, they have a collection um, of this poster and another illustration poster that they, you can see the black plate, you can see the yellow plate, you can see the blue plate. So this is a similar, this would have been done in, this, in a similar manner. You can see the, overlapping here of um, the colors. And um, it's just a really nice, it's a beautiful, it's an interesting color scheme to me. And this is something that we do see a lot in the Philadelphia posters is this particular blue. Um, and the one thing I'm going to say is this was, you know, right after the depression and the rebuilding of America. So there, are, um, there were limited materials. And so um, you will see a lot of the same colors being used um, because people had to make the most of whatever they had work to work with. Isn't that cool? And I'm just gonna look in the chat. So, oh, you wanna tell us what that means? What the, Michael, you wanna tell us? Oh, I was just looking up the word serograph because you mentioned it. So, um, and it was actually coined by um, Anthony Villanes, so who I'm yeah. sure you'll talk about shortly. Um, but he wanted to distinguish uh, the use of silk screening for artistic purposes versus um, industrial or, or commercial purposes. So, um, and it comes from uh, the Latin word sericum, which means silk, um, and the Greek word graph, of course, which means uh, drawing. So cool. I did not know that that, I thought it meant like in a series that you could like print in a series, which right. is true too. But now I know. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And we will take, we will leave time um, for reviewing the chat and doing a specific um, uh, Q&A at the end. So just to keep going here, I'm gonna get into the next one. Now I would actually, Michael, if you would tell me, if you could talk about this, because I still call this like the Japanese house and it's, that's not what this is. So right. could you tell us a little bit about this? Uh, sure, so um, yes, we kept calling this Shifuso uh, because of the Japanese, which is the name of the Japanese house in Fairmount Park here in, in Philly. Uh, except when I sent the image of this poster to Shifuso, uh, they said, this is not Shifuso. Um, and they clued me in on a little bit of history, which I did not know, uh, which is that before Shifuso was built in Fairmount Park, um, on that same site, there was an earlier structure, which is what you're seeing here. Uh, and it was a Japanese temple gate from the 1600s, I believe, so a very old structure that was um, brought to the US to be part of the Japanese exhibit at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, um, and then uh, moved to Philadelphia and put into Fairmount Park. Um, it actually burned in a fire 
um, in the 1940s and was destroyed. Um, and then um, Shifuso was built on that site later, not until the 1950s. Uh, so that is um, the background on that. The folks at Shibuso were thrilled to see this um, beautiful depiction of that uh, former building because there, there aren't many um, images of it. Oh, cool. So cool. And this is a similar thing where there, I mean, I think this is mostly brown, red, green, brown, blue. Maybe a black, but this may be brown that's doubled up on the green to make that blackish color. So cool. All right. So this is a um, poster of Old Swedes Church, which is. Um, Alex, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Didn't you just do something with them recently? Uh, yeah, if you like. Um, I um, So I was on uh, their, well, I will be when, when the episode is done. I was on their podcast. Um, and last year I gave a talk at um, at Old Swedes or Glory Day. Um, and Glory Day is a really interesting church. It's one of the oldest churches in Pennsylvania. Um, it was originally a Lutheran church. Today it's a, um, an Episcopal church and it has a couple of really neat connections to Carpenters Hall actually. So um, a couple of the carpenters that um, worked on Old Swedes Church were actually founding members of the Carpenters Company in 1724. So um, Glory Day was built at the turn of the 18th century. Um, and it actually precedes the existence of the Carpenters Company, but nonetheless, um, some members, uh, some some uh, of the carpenters that were in the building were later founding members, the Harrison um, of the Carpenters Company. The other interesting thing is that um, two former caretakers of Carpenters Hall, um, Sarah Stewart and Martha Stewart, are both buried at. Um, Old Swedes. Maybe it's one of these uh, grave stones that's being depicted here. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, oh, perhaps. But uh, so nonetheless, um, I've always found Glory Day's history uh, in regards to us interesting because there are so many um, interesting little connections like that between us and them. Um, in our um, object collections in our archive, we actually have a collection box that was used in the church at Old Swedes. Um, and I, I discovered that one day, which kind of got my interest going in terms of, of us and them. Nice. Um, but it's, it's a really interesting old church um, with a really interesting history, old history going back um, to uh, the Swedish colony that was here before Philadelphia. So check it out, guys. Great. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. All right. So this poster is in um the library uh but the the one that is hanging in the exhibit is actually from my collection so i was lucky enough to find a version it's a little bit different i'm actually going to pull up let's see if i can see, show you because it's a little bit different um uh, not there um the one that i own um it's a little bit it has like more of a little bit of a purple um color going on here um it's this is a piece that was done by Catherine millhouse and uh you will see that in this case her name is not only signed but it's actually part of the print um and so uh i'm gonna there we go um so she could do that because she was the director and she was pretty um, high up there and pretty well known as a commercial artist before she became a WPA artist. Um, this piece actually is a lithograph. It is not a screen print. And the way we know that even though we were able to, they were able to get like soft, you, you can see in that Swedes, uh, old Swedes church, a lot of like, you know, stippling, but that was still done 
uh, with uh, wax and crayons onto a screen. But um, this is, you can see these fine uh, pencil marks and uh, drawing marks here. That would have been difficult to do on a screen to get that level of detail. So this would have been done as a lithograph. Right. So another one of Carpenter's Hall. We know who did. Yeah, most. I think the only ones we know are the Kitchener Mill House ones that are in, that are hanging, um, in the exhibit at Carpenter's Hall. Is there anything, Michael, that you'd like to say about like, the way this is depicted? I mean, it seems like the two. I just want to go back. Oops, that's Betsy Boss. I mean, it's a building, so yeah. <laughs> they're depicted pretty much the way that the building looks. Yeah, I do think, um, I mean, to me, they both sort of place the building in a, you know, sort of fairly idyllic setting, uh, which, which we actually happen to be in now and was really designed by the Park Service um, when Independence National Historical Park was you know designed and and laid out um, in in the 40s and 50s. So, um, but but clearly um, in the you know late 18th century when Philadelphia was the capital of the country and the biggest city in North America, um, you know we were not surrounded by green uh, lawns and lots of trees. You know we were surrounded by tiny little streets and, and lots of buildings. Um, and we were on the bank of Dock Creek, which was a, you know, putrid, uh, infested, you know, sort of uh, backwater uh, of um, pollution um, even then. So um, I, you know, I think it's just interesting to note that, you know, these are not necessarily uh, realistic depictions of the setting, although clearly they capture the arc the architecture um quite well that's so interesting so because when i look at these posters i think of what it's like to walk into the walkway and to walk up to carpenter's hall but what you're saying is in 1936 or 37 it didn't it wasn't isolated in its own like beautiful setting right right well that that courtyard that connects to chestnut street um was there um, but clearly, so that's on the north side, but certainly on the, you know, east, west, and south, mm -hmm. which are very uh, green and open now, um, you know, it was not, it was not like that. That's so interesting. Wow. Art, art, is it art? Is it reality? Does it influence <laughs> reality? <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting to think if, you know, or if depictions like these done, at, you know, this was done 10 years or 15 years before Independence Park. So, you know, did they actually influence the way that the, you know, designers of the park uh, decided to, you know, sort of revert to this kind of idyllic green country town, uh, which of course was William Penn's original intention, but, um, you know, quickly Philadelphia, you know, outgrew that. Yeah. Yeah. Sheila saying in the chat, it's like an idealized vision. It's true. All right. Just a few more. And then I want to um, hand it over to Laura to talk about the collection and some more exciting things related to posters. So there are a couple of Betty Ross house. And I just want to talk a little bit about you know, this is, uh, the exhibit is called Places for the People WPA Travel Posters because this was originally uh, in conjunction with uh, Travel Month uh, in America, which is in May. That's what we originally um, planned it around. And the assignment for these artists, oh, you know what I never noticed? The cityscape <laughs> in the back here. Interesting. I see something every time. I've been doing this work for so long and every time I'm just like, oh my gosh, I love these. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the artists were charged with, it was a national initiative to uh, really um, elevate and celebrate places in the, in, uh, the United States. Um, and that was the assignment. And in Philadelphia in particular, there was um, 
like tourist spots, but mostly like memorial and landmarks. Um, and this was, it's important to understand the context of that work because it was done at a time when not only was there a depression and it left people um, very tight on money to be able to travel around, but this is the, you know, the prelude to World War II. So whereas a lot of people might have been traveling to Europe um, in the past for vacations or um, to, you know, as a part of travel, even to Canada or to other places around, that there was a certain level of like, you know, not moving around too much around the world, like almost like we're having now, where it, it's important to stay home, hunker down, and rebuild the country. But there was an effort to encourage people to um, see America and to you uh, to get out because tourism is a big part of the economy, the way money gets moved around, um, and as and as a form of entertainment, education, getting you know, learning about something different. All right, uh, so a couple more. This is another one. This is not attributed, but it, it's interesting because it's the exact same style as this one. I would not, I would not go so far as to say, well, it looks like the other Catherine Millhouse, therefore it is a Catherine Millhouse. Um, if the, if the, you know, it's it's noted as a Catherine Millhouse by the library because it is. It would, there's a tag on the back that says that it's Catherine Milhouse because it wasn't signed by her. And in some ways, as the director and the art director and me, me being a director of my own creative agency, I know how that can be, that like I can do a sketch and somebody else can render it and somebody else can be printing it. And, um, so it's interesting that this one wasn't tagged as her, um, but I, I just think it's important to recognize the, um, the stylistic similarities there. Well, and uh, and and as something that a lot of people noticed who saw, you know, when they were visiting an exhibit was actually the, uh, if you look at the two posters, the front of the building is actually very different. Um, and so somewhere along the way, the, the front of Betsy Ross House was modified, right? So you can see that the door, you know, is on a different side and that window is now becomes more of a shop window. Uh, so, um, Interesting. I, you know, so I think it's neat that the two posters actually capture two different, um, you know, iterations of that site. Is it the same side of the building? I wonder if this is inside the courthouse, court, courtyard. Ah, mm, that's and interesting. At, you know, like, cause there was a store, she did have like a storefront, right? right? right. But you can, you access this, you access the Betsy Ross house from the, from the from side. The side. Yeah, I never, right. I never even paid it. Oh, we, could, we might need to do a little more digging on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If anybody knows, let us know. <laughs> I know. Okay. Oh, um, who knows? I hope. Um, nope. When I worked at the Betsy Ross house, there was dispute on which house was hers. So, um, one of the grandchildren tried to identify the house and they picked the one that was in the better condition because they couldn't identify it because the park bench was gone. And I'm wondering if those both houses existed and they weren't sure at the time. Interesting. Well, thank you. Hope. So they that's... picked the house that was in the better condition. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's good. Thank you very much <laughs> for letting us know. All right. And then the last one is, uh, Memorial Hall, which is now, is it still the Please Touch Museum? It is. Of course, they're closed like everything don't touch. else. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't go anywhere. Don't look at anybody. Yeah, don't touch anything. Be, yeah, I was going to say, they'll be changing their name when they reopen. <laughs> yes. Yes, I know. <laughs> so funny. But this is another one of those. But I, I do want to call your attention to the colors. Again, like the same colors are being used because that's what they were, that's what they had. Um, and they really, I love, I just think they made the most of the contrast, um, the striking red, white, and blue, but a variation on red, white, and blue. So, all right. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand this over to Laura. Hang on, I gotta find you, Laura. Oh no, maybe you're at the top. Yeah, there you are. 
Okay, I'm going to make you the host, and you can share your screen. I'm the host now. All right. All right, how's that look? Great. I, our faces are probably over top, but you can... Um, no, it's... No, no, it's no. Yeah, you're just seeing that because you're the host. All right. So when um, the WPA ended in 1943, um, the General Services Administration divided the works of the WPA workshop in Philadelphia and gave them on long-term loan to the Free Library, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Um, over 1,200 drawings and prints at the library are part of this loan and tracked by the fine arts section of the GSA. 116 posters were also given to us, the print and picture collection. Um, oh, I've, I've never been a host before, so I just admit people as they come in, Ennis. <laughs> Um, I admitted yes. somebody. I hope that was fine. <laughs> I knew her name. All right. So 116 posters were also given to the printed picture collection in 1943, but they were not considered part of the loan and they're not tracked by the GSA, as you talked about before. Um, I like to show both of these um, together. The lithograph on the left was created in the federal art print shop that it's depicting. Um, the poster on the right was created in the poster workshop, and both the workshops were in the same building at 311 South Broad Street. And if you look in the Federal Art Print Shop uh, print, you can see the poster um, in the background. And I think because it's a lithograph, you're seeing it backwards. It was probably drawn uh, looking at the poster, and then you're seeing it backwards. I'm going to show you what I'm going to talk about today is I'm just going to show you some um, posters and prints from the collection and then also show you a few things from an exhibition we have coming up. All right, so here's some more posters and again they're local travel posters. The one on the um, left is advertising the Parkway Central Library and the one on the right is um, advertising the zoo. There are so many zoo posters. Um, if you look at Ennis's book, um, Posters for the People, you'll see so many zoo posters. Um, and I think when she visited us, she was surprised that we had zoo posters she had never seen before. Yes. Uh, <laughs> they've been in the library since 1943, but it was only recently that we inventoried them and scanned them all for, for everyone to know what we have. Here are some more posters. Um, Build for your Navy, promoting patriotism, and Pennsylvania Industries is promoting the value of work. Now in our print collection, we have examples that illustrate the process of printmaking. And we use these um, as teaching tools. We have classes um, from you know, elementary age to college age, um, classes from Fleischer Art Memorial, um, coming to visit. The print on the left is by Claude Clark. He was actually a painter, um, but he worked as a printmaker in the Philadelphia print shop. And he spent the rest of his life as a working artist and teacher. Uh, print shop supervisor Michael Gallagher did the one on the left and he drew on his uh, Scranton coal mining family history for the scene of rural poverty. I like the, the comparison, you know, this is all happening um, you know, during the depression, but we've got jump and jive and doomed. So these two watercolors bookend the New Deal years. Carl Schaefer's Billions of Ballet shows bankers in front of the stock market, um, a stock market chart, and he made that in 1934. And it was under the Public Works of Art program, which was under the Treasury Department. So it was a precursor um, to the WPA Federal Art Project. On the right, we have Hilda Pertha's watercolor Pearl Harbor, which was made in 1942 after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and that was near the end of the WPA. Now, the artist most represented in our print collection is Doc Thrash. 
who was born in Georgia in 1893 and traveled around before settling in Philadelphia in the late 1920s. He studied at the Art Institute of Chicago before and after serving in World War I, but developed his printmaking skills at the Graphic Sketch Club, which is um, the former name of Fleischer Art Memorial. And I love this. It's a photocopy we have of um, the autobiography, his autobiography, and it's in our art department's uh, research files. So Pix has over 60 prints created by Thrash, by Doc Thrash, um, most during his time at the Philadelphia Fine Print Workshop. Because of the strength of our collection, we were asked to host an exhibition to complement the Doc's Thrash exhibition at the African American Museum in Philadelphia. Um, this was all supposed to be happening around this time. Uh, I think the Doc's Thrash exhibition was at the African American Museum was supposed to start in December. And um, we, we were planning our exhibition to start maybe September or October. Um, my co-curator, Caitlin Goodman, um, who's, on, who's on the Zoom today, she's of the Rare Book Department, uh, we didn't want to duplicate their exhibition. We didn't want to have just a Doc Thrash exhibition since that's what they're having. So we started looking more broadly um, for evidence of the New Deal in works at the Free Library. And we found so much throughout the subject departments and special collections in Parkway Central Library. So for the greatest number, Artifacts of the New Deal, been in the works for many months. Um, we, our date is probably being pushed again, but we're hopeful sometime in 2021 you'll be able to see this exhibition. We really want people to be able to see it in person and not just a digital um, experience of it. So we're thankful that we, we may be able to um, push it back until we can have people in. So this exhibition takes a thematic, not a chronological look at the art and artifacts created by the WPA and other New Deal agencies. So I'm going to show you some highlights that we found in the library, subject departments, and special collections. If you look at this on the right, art and use, that is where we got our title. You can see the eagle holding um, the little banner strip that says art for the greatest number of people. Um, that pamphlet's from our art department. The government publications department um, has a vast collection of government publications. <laughs> On the left, there's a folk history of Wisconsin circus lore, and that was compiled by the Federal Writers Project, and it has a lovely binding that's created by the Milwaukee Handicraft Project. And on the right is, I'll just call it a mathematical something or other. Table of the first 10 powers. <laughs> it just shows it's not an official title. The, the mathematical something or other, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Over my head. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So cool. And our children's literature research collection, which actually has a collection of Catherine Millhouse um, materials. Um, and they also have Catherine Millhouse posters. They actually have a few that we don't have in pics um, as well. Hmm. Um, but they are scanned and you can find them on the digital collections. So our children's literature research collection also has this collection of models of houses, and I believe they are part of the Catherine Millhouse collection. Um, so they were created by the Museum Extension Project, which was devoted to creating visual aids for schools. Um, on the right, we have the Fleischer Collection of Orchestral Music. Um, they hosted a, um, a WPA-funded program in Parkway Central Library. And this score is dedicated to that project. It's um, called Fanfare for the WPA Music Copying Project. Our map collection includes this large and colorful map used to justify the works done by the Public Works Administration. Um, that's not our scan. We're getting it scanned now. But I don't know. Beautiful. Yeah, that's cool. And in our rare book department, um, they have Monroe Leaf's papers. And in the papers, it includes this script for a marionette production of his children's book, Ferdinand the Bull. And it was part of the Federal Theater Project. And he's there in that photo um, with workers in the New York City marionette workshop. 
and our theater collection includes playbills and other materials relating to the Federal Theater Project, um, which was probably the most controversial of the WPA um, art programs. Both of these playbills are from performances here in Philadelphia at the Walnut Street Theater. And back to the print and picture collection. So the print and picture collection is not just about uh, fine art prints or posters. Um, we have a rich Philadelphiana collection and it includes historic photographs. And these help us tell the story of the New Deal. Um, on the uh, left is a building in the Wissahickon created by stone masons, stone masons employed by the WPA. It's the 10 box and it's still there today. On the right is a photo showing the soldiers' bonus march demonstrations of 1932 before the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the creation of the New Deal. And I know I went really fast through my tour, but that's my tour. And if anyone um, would like to get in touch with us, we are not on site right now, but you can reach us at um, our website or you can email um, me directly at erefpix at freelibrary.org and I'll happy, be happy to talk about any of those items or if anyone has a question about anything you've seen today. Um, you know, you can put it in the chat now and someday soon, you know, we hope to see you and welcome you back at the library. Great. Okay, I'm going to- Thank gonna... you so much. So can you make me the- you can stop my share. Great. Um, go to participants. I had a lesson. Okay, great. Okay. Well, thank you so much. All right. So I'm seeing some questions in the chat, um, and I wanted to uh, take time to um, just, yeah, thank you, Laura, for showing this. It's like, whoa, I know that that's a tip of an iceberg. <laughs> and whenever I start to see just those tips of icebergs, it's really exciting to see what might be there. So I'm just gonna look through the chat, um, and I saw a few questions about reproductions. At the end, I will show you how you can get reproductions that benefits both Poster City People and the library. Um, and also um, uh, the, uh, the, new online shop of Carpenter's Hall. Um, so one question here was out of some 35,000 poster designs created by the WPA, have you ever seen any that were used to produce postcards at that time? Um, I, have, I have never seen postcards created by uh, WPA, uh, of WPA posters or through the division. There were small scale placards, and especially here in Pennsylvania, there was a huge um, uh, fish and game commission uh, initiative to make posters, and people made small scale placards that are really beautiful. Um, and I'm actually, while we're talking, I'm going to share my screen so we can make sure that you know that, post, that the Philadelphia Library's collection is all digitized, and Posters for the People has all the posters that we have found of the 35,000. Um, our count is up to 2,221 um, that we have images of. Um, there are more that we know uh, that are documented, but if I were to put in, um, uh, let's just go to the wildlife section. Um, so this is organized by different, um, uh, categories that are also this, uh, the same categories in the book. Um, but these were uh, placards that were for hunters and um, just small scale pieces that got like used and um, pushed around. But there's some really gorgeous ones. Um, these, these were not in the Philadelphia Poster Division and we have no idea who made these other than the Pennsylvania Game Commission, but we don't know who the artists were. Um, or any of that. Um, so if you're in Pennsylvania, these are the ones that we find the most out there um, at yard sales or on eBay, that type of thing. All right, let's see. Are there more questions in the chat? I'm just gonna go here. Is it possible to get prints from the collection? Yes. So we have uh, an arrangement, a partnership um, with the library, not just because we are uh, collaborating on all sorts of programs like this one. Oops, hang on, I just went crazy with the chat. Um, but we at Posters for the People 
our mission is to document and present the posters of the WPA. So we really want to get them out um, into the public. So we uh, provide um, reproductions and we uh, split the proceeds with the library or with anybody whose repository these reproductions are coming from. So you can get these on our site, Posters for the People, and I'm going to drop a um, discount code in Posters for the People. Uh, ooh, I wanna hear about your stuff, Peggy. Um, but if you use this discount code, winter 2020, um, you can use that at checkout on this site for a 10% discount. Um, uh, and it never expires, so you can keep using it <laughs> if you want and tell your friends. Um, so I noticed Peggy said, I have a large collection of Pennsylvania Museum Extension Project silk screens. Um, so we, yeah, we should talk about that, Peggy. We actually found um, a collection of like quilt patterns from uh, Pennsylvania Dutch quilt patterns and other teaching uh, um, device pieces. And those would have been printed by um, this and designed by the poster division, but um, at the request of the museum extension. So we, um, oh, yeah. Sorry, there, there's a question about the carborundum print process. I don't know if you saw that. Tell us about carborundum print. Yeah, L Laura, you might know more about this. Like you were telling me about it because I didn't know either. And I want to pull up my the video, the short uh, demo um, in just a minute. But do, could you talk? Could you address that? So um, it was invented at um, the Philadelphia Print Workshop by Doc Sash, Michael Gallagher, and um, Hugh Mesabov. The, the three of them worked on different parts of it and they perfected it while they were there. Now, I am not an artist and I have a mental block about describing printmaking techniques. Um, I do know um, my co-curator, Caitlin, is on the call. She does know more about it and how it's done. And I'm sure there's some artists on the call who do. But I also yeah. could recommend that you could, the, uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art had a Doc Strash exhibition in the early 2000s. And they still have their um, PDFs of um, some of the exhibition text and also a really great description on the carborundum and other printmaking methods um, in there. Uh, so I would recommend looking at that. Great. Okay, I'm gonna share, speaking of printing process, I'm gonna share um, the video of, uh -oh, um, of me doing a little demo um, of the screen printing process. Technology was born. And 
So we can thank Anthony Malonis for the work of um, Andy Warhol and Sean Ferry and uh, Karina Kent, um, who all use screen print process as a popular medium to make posters to get out to the people. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, look at the different uh, parts and we're going to print up um, some posters. For this demonstration, we're using a pre-printed uh, shell that already has some ink on it. So if you were able to come to Carpenter's Hall, um, if we were in the middle of the pandemic, we would have a demonstration where you could come and make your own poster. And so we create, we printed this first color here to simulate what it would be like to have a two color poster. So we have these poster shells and then we have a screen that has been prepared with some areas where the ink will go through um, and put a second color on top of the ink. Um, we're going to use it today. So screen printing is a technology that basically blocks out all of the areas where you don't want the ink and it leaves holes where you do want the ink. And you just squeegee you the ink over it. It's not like a block print where you would have had to have done it in reverse. Um, or a, lit a lithograph. So some of the posters that are in this exhibit, um, most of them are screen printed, um, and a couple of them, this one in particular, um, the Pennsylvania uh, poster by Kathy Nellis was a lithograph. So there were all sorts of different types, but the majority of them are done with silk screen. So we have a screen, we have our um, uh, poster set up underneath it, and we just have some um, water-soluble ink, and we're gonna pour that up at the top, um, and I already have a um, poster aligned underneath here, um, and this board is what we use to take the wipe around to. You can use it outside, and, uh, it's portable. Um, and the only important thing is that it is uh, locked down, so nothing is shifting while we're printing. Um, so then I take my squeegee, and I have my ink here, and I'm at a 45 degree angle, and I'm gonna pull toward myself in the most uh, even and moderate pressure way. And I only do it once, um, and then I bring it back here, so it is not going to drip, and I leave my squeegee there. And normally the, the poster might stick to the uh, screen, and I can't put the screen down because it is wet underneath there, but now we have um, a second color on there. So I'm going to transfer it over here, and I'll tell you what screen printers have to do. So you have to put this up here. I'm going to move that over there, and then I'm going to put it in a drying bag. And you can also do this at, um, with students at schools. You can also just hang them on a line. Um, so screen printing was designed to be something that a lot of people could just do easily. Um, you can transfer your designs easily. Um, and there were over 35,000 designs, of which 2 million posters were printed pretty much in the same way um, by printers in the demo So I'm going to do one more. that out. All right. Great. All righty. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Great. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this. Um, great. I hope that you enjoyed this field trip. It was great to see some familiar faces. Hi, Heather. I'm so glad you made it. Uh, and some people that I know are on the posters for the people mailing list, and I've never seen your faces before. So it's so wonderful to have you here. Um, I wanted to make sure that you knew about the um, Carpenters Hall. Hang on, I just want to share one more time. And uh, lead you over to the Carpenters Hall website, um, where you can also visit 
uh, their store um, where they have uh, other items and that beautiful face mask that uh, Alex was um, modeling for us today. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. <laughs> So um, I hope that everybody has a wonderful end of year holiday season. Keep the faith. Um, these posters are a representation that art um, can really get us through some rough times. We can rebuild and we can um, do it together. So thank you very much for being here. And uh, we'll keep in touch. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.